Hey everyone, welcome to What Could Go Wrong live on this lovely Wednesday afternoon. We took a couple weeks off to talk about how unqualified I am, but we're back today with Will Richardson, who I'm super excited about because I, I may or may not stalk you like just a little on especially Twitter, I feel like, because you're always posing these really interesting questions around education, which is cool because as the co-founder of The Big Questions, it's that's kind of, you know, your thing. That's right. <laughs> so, tell us more about kind of what that means, that what that, um, what you do, and, and all of that. I'd love to hear more on that. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, first, thanks for having a conversation today. Appreciate it. So, actually, I was a high school teacher for uh, eighteen years, then a supervisor, uh, kind of administrator for about four years, and then the last sixteen years or so, I've been. Um, basically writing, speaking, traveling the world, um, and uh, kind of reinventing myself every, every five or six years. Yeah. So my latest reinvention, <laughs> my latest reinvention is the Big Questions Institute, and I, I think this is it. I think I'm going to stick with this one because I'm really, I'm you really found loving, one? I'm loving this work. I, I love my partner, Homa Tavangar. She's amazing, and um, we're just having a lot of. I, it's fun, but it's also a lot of hard work in terms of trying to help schools and uh, individuals, uh, leaders mostly. We've, we've, we're working a lot with international schools right now. But anyway, wow. just trying to help, just trying to help them frame contexts right now for um, having a bigger conversation and asking big, mm-hmm. bigger questions about schools, about their their roles, and about the institution's role in terms of learning and all of that kind of stuff. So. Uh, we just see this as a moment where we have to get a little bit more existential than we have been in the past, yeah. and we're trying to yeah. find a way. We're trying to find a way of leading people to those questions without having them jump off the cliff because they get scary. And yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, if you really want to go to the heart of the work, then you have to be willing to tell some difficult truths <laughs> about the work that we do that doesn't mm-hmm. make a lot of common sense and really isn't um, supportive of the learning that we want kids to do. So. Uh, it's an interesting space, right? It's an interesting kind of headspace to be in to kind of navigate that um, kind of narrow path where people can engage in those big questions, but uh, where they don't get turned off to having those conversations. And they're really just necessary right now. So it's it's really, it's, I agree. It's, I'm having a great time doing it and it's a good place to be right now. I love that. And I feel like it's very similar to this Um, my thing is this what could go wrong um, concept, which is has a whole backstory and I won't go into that, but it's essentially a a slang of this growth mindset um, versus fixed mindset, right? What are you taking on? What questions are you asking? How are you evolving and changing outside of what you feel like you can do? Um, And so a lot of the questions that you ask, I feel like resonate with me a lot in that type of mindset. But one thing you mentioned was, you know, asking the questions without jumping off the cliff. And I do find in conversations that I have with educators and with schools and even just with, you know, other human beings, it is scary to ask those big questions because then you have to be open to these big answers (laughs) that might challenge you. And that can be scary. Or, or you have to be answer. You have to be open to no answers. Right. And I I do think that there are probably, (laughs) there are probably no answers right now. You know, we, yeah, we kind of yeah. like to shift the language away from trying to get, trying to find a new normal to just embracing a no normal. Because I, oh, I think I like that, that. you know what's happening right now is so many different layers of challenges that are coming together at one moment, and you know we can run through them all in terms of just the pandemic and climate and social and racial justice and you know the whole political. Um, uh, upheaval that's been happening, the <laughs> folk dem- you know, the whole literacy. What is? Oh true. yes. So, you know, I mean, it's it's uh, it's really difficult right now to make sense of all of that. But um, where people really come close to the edge is when you ask them, well, why don't we just do some interrogation? What what have schools contributed to all of that? Right? Because I think that you know, mm-hmm. if we go back, if we go back to normal. Um, we're going back to something that created these problems in the first place. 
And I, I think again, yeah. it's this is the really, really hard part, but we have to ask ourselves, how are, is the school experience that we've pretty much constructed here and, and been running for the last couple hundred years with some changes on the edges, but how is right. that contributing to social and racial injustice? How is that contributing mm -hmm. to inequity? How is that contributing to kids and people's inability to parse truth in the world, right? And I mean, right. we, we have to own some of that because a lot yeah. of what we've done has ignored that and really hasn't created the the dispositions and hasn't developed and nurtured the types of you know critical thinking skills and whatever else that people need to to get through the world right now. So that's where it gets really scary, right? And there are no answers. Yeah. I mean, we that's why we right. ask questions, and we don't claim mm -hmm. to have answers for any of these. But and and I think in every school school in every district, the answers are going to be because of right. just you know who the communities are. Um, but certainly we, we try to pull a little bit towards some progressive lenses in terms of how we think about the answers to those questions. There were so many beautiful like wisdom nuggets <laughs> inside of what you just said that we could just branch off of. But I think, um, you know, overall, the things that stood out to me was there are there are no answers. Right. And there's a friend of mine who's writing a book about consciousness and education and um, as she's doing it, she's interviewing other educators and teachers and those types of things and asking them questions and talking about what that means to bring this sense of consciousness, awareness into education and asking these questions in a better way and then allowing ourselves to find the answers. And one of my favorite things about those types of conversations is not we're not coming at you with, hey, here's the five tools you need to fix your school forever. Right. Because if that was the answer, I feel like we would have or should have done that a long time ago. <laughs> None of our five tools to fix all your problems have ever worked. So coming at it from a different way of let's ask these questions together and then co-construct the answer, I think is so seemingly simple, but also huge at the same time, because it requires us to kind of put aside our ego of I know what the answers are to how can we figure this out? Neither of us have been able to find the answer so far. Yeah, and I think the lenses for that conversation, we talk a lot about that too, right? That the lenses for those conversations have really changed. And I mean, they've mm -hmm. even even in just the last couple of years, I mean, a lot of this stuff has been kind of bubbling under the surface. There's a Adrian Murray Brown quote that we use a lot, which says, you know, things aren't necessarily getting worse, they're getting uncovered, right? And yeah, and that, yeah. Um, but what what is really, hard about this now and what makes it kind of so challenging is that the more people that realize what's being uncovered or what's been uncovered um the more kind of you know intense these conversations get i mean mm -hmm. um again you, you can't and we're kind of u.s centric here right but you can't look at this country and and not see how different it is today from just two years ago I mean, you oh, know, yes. it, it's a it's a totally different place, <laughs> and mm -hmm. and the, the 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 difference is, I think, the intensity of it is because so many more people now are realizing the challenges that we have. Whether again, it's climate, right. race, or inequity, or all of those things, they're they're just coming to the surface, and now we're all bearing that burden, and we're all beginning to right. ask questions, different questions, and have different conversations because we have to now. We we can't ignore those things any longer. Right. Yeah. And I love that there. I love that because so often the conversation is, you know, um, well, we didn't have these problems when I went to school or, or, you know, that's not anything that ever existed before. These are all new. And I love kind of the quote that you mentioned there is that it's not new. It's now just a conversation that we're having. It's becoming uncovered um, because, you know, racial inequity, as we know, is not new. Um, but it's becoming more and more prevalent because we're allowing ourselves to have, or not prevalent, but more and more, we're becoming more aware of it, if you will, because we're allowing ourselves to have these conversations surrounding these inequities that before many of us would just kind of push off to the side and pretend like they didn't exist. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Which was and doing think, nobody any good. <laughs> no, it's not. And I think too, you know, again, and, and our conversations, you know, the, the conversations that home and I have <laughs> many of them on Slack extended like texts, but um, <laughs> we've been talking, we've been, we've just been reading and talking a lot about um, this, this kind of idea that we really are at a point where we have to um, stop thinking about ourselves as individuals in this work, but really use the lens of the entire earth, you know, that it's, it's,
this is much bigger any person any longer and that yeah. um you know even in schools we're gonna have to we're gonna have to put aside kind of the individual goals and the individual successes that we've defined them in mm -hmm. the past and find some way of, of, of configuring our work to serve the entire earth um i yeah. mean we're at that point right now i i really feel that um and it's not because i'm sitting in 98 degree heat right now um but <laughs> i really feel like we're at a, a, a very, very um, defining moment in the history of the, the planet, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. it's hard. it sounds like hyperbole, but I don't think it is. I think we're, I right, think we're right. in, right? And so we can't, in schools, not embrace that and not see our work right. through that lens. We have to have kids, you know, doing work for the world, in the world, with the world, it can't just be this isolated thing that we do in our, you know, local communities any longer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think you know one of the bonuses, if there are, if there were any, if you can call them that, of the pandemic and all of that was, we began to see all of these barriers begin to be broken down and. Um, a, a sort of unification of people who may not have ever been having conversations before. Um, you know, for example, my oldest daughter went to a learning platform called Galileo, where she was able to work in an international learning environment. Um, you know, and so where she wouldn't have had those types of opportunities before. And I'm working with, you know, I'm talking to you, which I most likely would not have sure. done before and those types of things. So that is, you know, a bit of a bonus that we've seen of kind of experiencing the positives of working outside of our tiny little our bubble and kind of breaking that out and seeing what's outside of there yeah and i think um you know the question that i always have about those other types of learning environments and i, I think you know if you step back and you look at what we were many schools were forced to do last year right which is mm -hmm. move this online environment to the zoom you know the zoom right. Room sessions right. or whatever else i think the bigger question is always so what changed, right? Aside from the yeah. technology, did anything fundamentally right. change about that? And I think the answer in most cases is, is that it didn't. Uh, it didn't really change. What what I found uh, fascinating and um, hopefully, uh, you know, just just uh, something that people maybe can tap into is that when we as adults reflect on what we've been able to do, the learning that we've right. been able to do with one another, not just you and mm -hmm. me, but you know, the learning that we've been able to do with people around the world, the problems we've solved together, the ways that we've collaborated, not dependent on being in the same space, all of that stuff. When you ask most people who have been, who, who've been working in this space over the last 18 months, if this has been a really powerful learning experience for them, almost every one of them says, absolutely. I've been, oh, yeah. I've been, you know, I've been connected to people. <laughs> I've, I've gotten different, you know, points of view. We've worked out. It's been intense. It's almost, you know, the leaders that we've worked with basically minute to minute problem solving, you know, collaborative mm -hmm. problem solving around the world. And they go, it's been really profound and really powerful. But then I always ask, so how does that learning that you've done in the last 18 months map to what your kids are doing in school, whether they're on technology or whether they're face to face? And almost everybody just kind of takes a pause and goes, yeah, not so much. Not yeah. so much. That's not yeah. what it looks like. It's not real right. problem solving. It's not real passion-based, interest-based, need-based learning that my kids are doing. It's more, yeah, this is the curriculum now. This is the course I have to take. This is how it's going to be delivered, you know? And and so not much has changed. Um, and again, that's another one of those things that I think we have to be honest about. We've changed the mechanism, but by and large, we haven't changed the, the amount of agency that kids have. We haven't changed the way they're assessed in any meaningful way. We haven't changed, um, you know, the, uh, the, the curriculum in any real way. So, um, you know, yeah, I think we shifted a little bit, but I'm not sure uh, the extent to which those shifts were, were really uh, big time shifts in terms of learning. I think that's a great um, thing because I agree. I've had many conversations with educators and people in the field who are who have been engaged in this now experiential learning, you know, experience, whether or not they wanted to do it. <laughs> they were thrown into this opportunity to learn experientially and right. the methods of which we've been able to, um, I guess, retain information and then change to match has been, we've been able to experience the value of experiential learning, right? But right. then what is, how are we taking that and translating that into our practices in the classroom? And the problem there is we begin to run into all of those political barriers, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's an, a, 
a numerable number, a numerable number, that's probably not right. <laughs> a high number of barriers between wow. what we're learning and how we get that there. Um, and like, what is the question that we ask there to begin to break down those barriers between getting it from our experience? We know this is valuable to implementation. Well, you know, I think it's common sense. I think we just have to ask common sense questions. I mean, you know, when I was a teacher, basically, I learned more about teaching by teaching than anything else. Um, the, the stuff I learned in school about teaching went out the window probably a week in, right? It was just like, okay, all that yeah. stuff was like theory and it, yeah, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really work. But anybody who's in a profession, anybody who's working will say the same thing. Um, you know, where do you, doctors, surgeons, they learn more, they learn a lot in school. Some of those high level professions, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, we, want, we want those people to be in school. We want them to be learning right. uh, those things, but still they learn more by doing surgery than they do by reading yeah. texts and, and all right. of that. So, you know, we learn by doing every, you know, PSA learning is the consequence of experience. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's not rocket science and, and it's, it's common sense. And we all own that until we get into a school setting where we just kind of say, well, no, we're going to teach you this stuff without you experiencing it on, in the hopes that when you maybe sort of do experience it, you remember what we've ta taught you about. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, right. It doesn't, it doesn't work. I mean, it's, right. you know, we, we talk a lot about, um, you know, kind of, uh, if you really want to go back to normal, let's tell some truths about what normal is. And one of the truths yeah. about normal in schools is that um, most kids forget most of what they've learned as soon as the test is over. That's oh, absolutely. The, that's the yeah, absolutely. And everybody and yeah. everybody kind of goes, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Well, why do yeah. we want to go back to that? <laughs> you know, yeah, why if do we, we know wanna... this, why do we just keep perpetuating right. it? <laughs> why do we why do we keep doing these things that we know stand in the way of learning? Why do we silo out mm -hmm. um, subjects? Why do we age group kids? You know, why do we fill in the blank? Right. That's one of our yeah. nine questions. That's one of our yeah. big questions in the book that we wrote. You know, so I don't know. It, it that's one of the frustrating things for me is that. Uh, everybody agrees that there are some yeah. just things that we do, many things that we do in schools that just don't make any sense when it comes mm -hmm. to learning, yet we continue to do them because we feel like we're powerless to change them. I don't think we're powerless, by the way. I think it's difficult. But I think that yeah. one of the ways you start is by building the capacity of people in your school community to engage mm -hmm. in these types of conversations and then come to answers and solutions together. I agree. And I love that framework that you put around it because um in my most re whoa whoa <laughs> screw my computer on the ground in my most recent role um as a school director when they brought me in it was a 30 year old school and a lot of the staff had been there for a long time the practices had been the same you know all of that and one of the biggest things i heard when i started asking questions and introducing things such as growth mindset and you know um we were switching to reggio emilia and all those types of things people were saying you know, when I would ask them to defend, why do you still put a two year old in a corner when he does something wrong? Well, that's what we've always done. But why? Well, that's just how we've always done it. Right. But why? <laughs> right. So you right. continue in this pattern. I think so many of the things that we just consider that we place under this normal and because it's normal, it's right and acceptable. And what we're supposed to be doing is really just because, I mean, this is what we've always done. It looks like this when I was in school, it looks like this now. And I have a a friend who always says, if school looks the same as when you were in school, then, you know, we're doing it wrong because we're changing so rapidly. There's no way it should look the same um, from year to year and especially not from generation to generation. And, you know, let's be honest. I mean, schools have changed a fair amount. Right. right? I mean, oh, yeah. They, they, they have become much more um, student centered in a lot of, in a lot of ways. And certainly, um, some schools have been willing to innovate and really try different things and be, and, and look at the world a little bit differently, but at its right. core, we're still driven by the same things mm -hmm. we've been driven by for the past hundred years. And, yeah. and the problem now too, is that, uh, and this is another thing we write about a lot is that, you know, schools have, schools used to be defined as a public good where the mm. idea was you'd send your kids to the community school, they would learn how to be a good citizen, they would learn how to participate, they would contribute to the world, you know, all that good stuff. Right. Um, and that was really the primary function is to create a citizen. Now, schools have turned into, most schools, especially independent schools, have turned into a private good. I mean, they really are just about 
How can we gain more access to more education, to better jobs, more high pay, right? At the mm -hmm. expense of, at the really, at the expense of the, the cooperative, at the expense right. of doing anything that makes, um, you know, that, that brings up the, the whole group, the whole community. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, and parents will fight tooth and nail for individual opportunities for their kids at the expense of opportunities for other kids. And I get yeah. why they do that. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not, uh, maybe I'm throwing parents under the bus a little <laughs> bit, right? But, but, right, but yes. But, I, but, but they're not the only ones going under the bus, right? Yeah. We all kind of think like that. And like, goes back to what I said before, we got to stop thinking like that. We can't, yeah. we, we're not going to survive if we continue to go down a path where it's all about individual success, where it's all about individual attainment. Mm -hmm. That's not going to work. We're not going to, I mean, that's an existential path uh, and right. that ends in a bad way. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to somehow get back to this idea of community, get back this, to this idea that, you know, we need to, we need to do things in the service of the group rather than the service mm -hmm. of the individual. But it's really, really hard. The narratives are, are totally baked in to yeah. what, what we think school is about and should be about. So it's hard. Yeah, it is definitely hard. And I think you had mentioned somewhere in there that it really comes down to the level of, you know, awareness and, and growth and alignment and all those types of things within the individual educators, the people that are involved in this process. And I think part of that is something I'm really passionate about is, you know, we can't give what we don't have. So if we want this to be baked in to the education system, we want our students to ask bigger questions and we want them to pursue bigger goals outside of just themselves and those types of things, then we as educators need to go in with that sort of, that type of awareness and that type of consciousness on a larger scale, which can, you know, if we were to get to that point, it really requires us to step back and ask some questions about ourselves and what we believe and why we believe it and those types of things. And that can be really challenging. Absolutely. And um, I think schools by and large do a pretty crappy job of building the capacity of teachers mm -hmm. and, and adults in the buildings to engage in those types of conversations on a regular basis. We don't make space for it. We don't make time for it. We focus pretty much all of our conversations on teaching um, right. you know, on how to teach better. Uh, that's not, those aren't the questions that we're talking about here, right? We're, we're yeah. really talking about what does it mean to be a teacher right now? Um, yeah. What is, you know, what is, what is basically our role in a world where we're facing unending uncertainty and chaos? You know, I mean, it yeah. just, it kind of, it, it changes us again at our core. So again, we, we, when we talk about those nine big questions too, we, we frame it in a way where, you know, there's an individual kind of conversation where each of us has to engage in those. What do we feel is sacred? You know, how do we define learning? You know, how do we define wellness? All those things. But then we also have to tackle them institutionally. It's kind of mm. parallel, parallel paths, right? But the problem is you can't really deal with them institutionally until basically we've talked about them as individuals. And what we see in a lot of schools is that, you know, you get a group of people together and you talk about change or you talk about doing something different. And you've got some people who actually are living in the 21st century, but then you've got a couple of people who are still like in the 19th century where they're <laughs> thinking about education and you just can't, you can't move that. Yeah. And so you need to constantly be building capacity of teachers, okay. of parents, of leaders, everybody within the system to engage and to, you know, to be kind of a little bit fearless about it to, to, you know, we were writing, we were doing actually a session in a couple of weeks on fearless inquiry so that, um, there's a there's a safety to doing that. There's a trust. Mm -hmm. to doing that. There's a culture that says, "Look, yeah, we understand this is a little bit scary and it's a little bit tenuous and whatever else, but we want to engage in these conversations. We yeah. want to push ourselves to kind of that edge and then look out from the edge and and see what we see rather than turning back to you know again going back to what we what we know what we're comfortable with." But then what we also in our heart of hearts knows is contributing to <laughs> the current situation in ways that right. make it very productive, you know, so. Yeah. And I love that concept of, you know, that fearless inquiry. And for me, that was that's actually kind of the basis of where this what could go wrong came from with my staff that I worked at previously, because it was constantly let's push it to the edge, see what we see and then go forward from there. And our slang for that was, you know, I love what could go wrong, right? Are we harming ourselves or others? No. Okay, great. Let's try it. Let's see 
what right. could go wrong? And that's been a huge motivator in my life as I've switched from working inside of a school building to working outside of a school building. And then I resonate a lot with a lot of the things that you're saying because I was, I am, I work consulting with schools and districts and individuals and education related companies and those types of things in various roles. But what I have seen over the past year as I've been doing that more intensely is a lot of what you're talking about, right? We can go in and teach you how to teach and how to be organized and how to do all of those things, but that's not anything new. And we're, we're really not resolving the, the foundational issue of these big questions. And so that was one thing that I kept seeing recurring and why I switched or I added on kind of this coaching concept into it because it was more of, we've got to start asking more questions. Like you talked about the capacity of the educator. We've got to work on ourselves first so that we can then bring more aware and more aligned selves into this because it's going to be hard. And if we want our students to do this, then we need to model it for them. All of that's hard. <laughs> it is. And you know, that modeling also speaks to the idea that um, a lot of educators don't have any other stories to frame their work through. Right. And mm. they, they kind of, um, um, live in a bubble where it's, yeah. it's based on what they experienced. It's based on what policymakers tell them the expectations are. It's based on, you know, kind of what the, the systems and the practices are that have been baked into wherever they're at, you know, for many, many, many years. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that we've been doing a lot of is just having people tell new stories and, and yeah. having, having, you know, especially with leaders, leaders kind of going, well, I didn't know you could do that type of thing. And you yeah. can do that. You can actually, <laughs> you know, you can actually do project-based learning at a high level and and kids will do fine on whatever test it is that you have them take you know you can you can right. actually give them more freedom and agency you can actually put the curriculum away um, for a good chunk of time and mm -hmm. it will be absolutely fine and the outcomes that they arrive at will be a little bit different but they'll be actually even more relevant to the right. thing that right. they need to be able to do when they leave you. So storytelling right now is a big deal as well because there are, the cool thing about this moment is that on the edges at least, we're seeing lots of schools popping up all over the place that are extremely progressive in the way that they think about learning and mm. that are beginning to scale maybe, you know, I mean, it's still it's still pretty, pretty uh, I, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a movement yet. It's not like a right, movement right. yet. But, but what's what's interesting is too we've been talking to a lot of parents who are going once we tell those types of stories they kind of go you know what i want that I, mm. I want i want that for my kid because this thing over here that we've been doing it's it's okay and it'll get them into a college but they're yeah. not engaged they're not right. really learning a lot and you know i i think it'd be better if they were absolutely doing work in the world experiencing things that would better serve them for the lives they're going to lead so i think I think that's bubbling up, which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of this redefinition of success, right? I mean, we assumed that grades and tests in college, that was the goal. This is success. And now through right. all of this, we're starting to go, uh, is that really, you know, the final destination? Is that what we want? Or could that look different? Well, what if, what if success was defined by um, what the wellness of kids, both physical, emotional, you know, spiritual and mental yeah. wellness? I mean, yeah. it, that, would be an, that would be an interesting kind of yardstick for that. Right. I don't, know, I don't, I don't quite know how you measure that, but right. uh, I think that I think that we actually have to privilege, not privilege, but we have to center wellness much more than we have in the mm -hmm. past. Mm -hmm. I was reading something actually today that said now um, they're seeing, you know, uh, counselors and therapists are seeing a lot more eight-year-olds who are anxious and depressed mm -hmm. and stressed. Yeah. And yeah. Look, you know, again, not to make all of this a downer, but, you know, we it's this is the reality of our life right now. Mm -hmm. um, our kids are going to be reading articles and looking at videos about storms, about heat waves, about fires, about, you know, all sorts of climate catastrophe that's coming our mm -hmm. way, whether or not we whether or not we mitigate the, you know, the the carbon output <laughs> in time. Right. You know, right. where people trying to, it doesn't matter. We're in the throes right now of a a shift in mm -hmm. the way that the climate is going to act, and it's not good. It's going to be brutal, right. Right. Um, and and so we have to prepare kids for that. We in, that mm -hmm. should be what school is about. How will you yeah. live in a world 
that where, where climate issues and inequity and all of those things are going to be increasingly difficult to, to, mm-hmm. to just mentally navigate to, right. you know what I mean? To emotionally navigate. Right. Um, I don't know. I don't know even how to do this. I mean, I'm serious. I, I, I think that that has to be part of what we do now. You know, I'm, I, I remember seeing the Greta Thunberg special, you know, and just listening to her and just the struggle that she has in terms of just staying even a little bit optimistic and positive mm-hmm. and whatever else. And not that all of our kids are Greta Thunberg, obviously, but right, right. Um, a lot of them, they feel it and they know it. My kids mm-hmm. know it. My daughter, it's heartbreaking. You know, she's 23 years old and she always says, well, I'm probably not going to have kids. I, mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't really know if I want to bring kids into this world right now. And, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. that's not an intellectual decision, right? That's a, right, an emotional right. decision. It's yeah, a, yeah. it's all of that. So, yeah, it sucks. But, okay, it's the reality. Um, and if we're going to be in schools, we have to take that on. We just, we yeah. have to take yeah. that on. That has to be the, the, the focus of our work. Yeah. yeah. You know, because yeah. there's something I'm always talking about is the future of education is we don't know the future of education. I mean, the future of the world is we don't know the future of the world. The future of anything is we don't know the future of anything right so i think it comes down to how are we instilling and then encouraging these critical thinking skills um and there's a book called the organized mind where and it was written maybe 10 years ago i'm i'm not entirely sure but he talks about where at the time that it was written we were intaking and processing over 700 newspapers worth of information a day right and i'm sure that has dramatically increased over the past 10 years sure but like Think about how we're having to process that type of information. And then we have young humans who are also having to do the same thing. So what are we doing as educators to kind of facilitate the ability to take in, mitigate, you know, delineate, like think through and then retain what's necessary and set aside what's it, what is it? That's critical thinking. That's emotional intelligence. That's so many different big factors, not just do you know your math skills and, you know, will you pass your chemistry right. exam? Right. And so I think there is one future that we know, right? And I, I, I think that we know what the future of learning is, mm. because I think the future of learning is the same as what learning was 100, 200, 300 years ago. I don't, right. I think, I don't think learning changes. I think yeah. we all know that we learn best when we have a passion, when we're connected to other people who share that passion, mm-hmm. when we're doing real work in the world, when we have a safe learning environment, when it has relevance in our lives, you know, all those things. Yeah. I, I don't think that sh- that's not going to change. I kind of bristle when I read articles, the future of learning. And I go, no, there's, <laughs> we know what the future of learning is. It's the, same right. as it is today. it's the exact same as it is today. And so the job becomes now, how do we create the conditions that we know contribute to really deep and powerful mm-hmm. learning mm-hmm. in the contexts of all the stuff that's happening around us right now. Because right. you're right, we don't know what the future of the world is. We don't know what the future of politics and all that kind of stuff is. But I'm, I'm, I, I know that 50 years from now, people will be learning in the same ways that they learn today. They may have mm-hmm. different tools, but right. the conditions are not gonna change. The conditions will not change. Yeah, and we know, I mean, the need for relationship and community inside of the learning environment hasn't changed, you know, and that's no. something that will remain static, you know, and that we know that there's pieces of this that aren't going to change. And how are we kind of diving into those? Um, and so I want to address the question that this originally started from. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I know it, it wasn't even a question. It was more of a, just a yeah. statement, but it really resonated yeah. with me because it was very growth mindset versus fixed mindset. Right. And Um, It was a tweet I think you put out that said, school should be a place where students are encouraged to explore what they might become, not a place that constantly reminds them of what they are. And that was just like, right? I mean, what does that look like? How does that mean? Like, what was, what went into that question? I have no idea what that means. No, but I think, you know, I mean, it's, 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 again, you know, it's like, um, when you look at the practices in schools, basically we're trying to sort, we're trying to um, kind of uh, define kids by the work that they do in our classrooms. And we mm-hmm. give them grades, you know, and we, yeah. we, you know, all that stuff, all that really bad stuff that we do. Yeah, yeah. That impacts kids in negative ways. Again, that we all know. We all that we know all that agree is not great. We all agree we do it anyway. Grades, <laughs> grades suck. They're not motivators for learning. They don't measure right. learning very well. Yeah. You know, the list goes on and on and on. I shouldn't grade, right? But we continue to do that. Mm-hmm. 
But what that does is basically is continually reinforces who they are in this moment. They're continually, mm -hmm. they're continually defining themselves by what they get on the latest test or how they get right. in, in the class or whatever else. Schools should be more about helping them to explore what they might become in the world, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you know, this is kind of the argument that I have with um, a lot of traditional thinkers about schools. It's not even an argument, but it's a, it's a good conversation about. Yeah. Well, you can't throw out the whole curriculum. You know, kids have to learn something. Right. They have to have. Right. You, know, you can't just let them go go wild and you know Summerhill and do whatever they want, play guitar for twelve years. You can't let them do that, right? Well, I, I, I maybe you can number one, but that's a difficult <laughs> argument to make. But, um, but yet you don't have to do as much curriculum as you do. Right. You don't right. have to do as much grading. You don't have to give as much homework. You don't cover as much as you have in the past. Right. You can make space for kids mm -hmm. to pursue learning on their own terms. And we see it, right? We have this thing, it's called genius hour. And it's this, you know, right. everybody, everybody's on the genius hour train because for <laughs> number one, I think kids actually enjoy it. They actually, yeah, you know, right. Shocking. And, and two, it kind of eases our conscience a little bit while well, we're giving them some agency. We feel better about mm -hmm. ourselves. That we're mm -hmm. out we can check out. that box. We'll just yeah, check my, that right yeah, off. My, my kind of throwaway line on that is, you know, every time I talk to teachers about genius hour, they just rave about what their kids are doing. And I always ask, well, if it's so freaking good, why don't you have curriculum hour and make the rest of it genius, right? Because it's like- I like this, let's do that. Why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you, you know, if it's so good, why not just bump the curriculum in there when you can, mm -hmm. but really let them- So anyway, that's kind of what that tweet was about, right? Let, yeah. Why don't you put more emphasis in creating space for kids mm -hmm. to explore who they might become, to tap into mm -hmm. the things that they might be really interested in. And then importantly, let them go there. Let them, yeah. you know, let them go into those spaces with some depth. Let them gain some mastery into that. Not at the expense of throwing out the whole curriculum and right. you know, all of that. But come on, you know, we can make a lot more space for student agency in real ways where they pursue things that they really care about. And in the context of doing that, they become much more powerful learners than they do studying for the final exam that they're gonna get a grade on and then forget the next day. Right. But you passed. So I mean, that's all that matters. It was like yeah. me when I took macroeconomics. It was like, what grade do I need to pass again? Yeah, right. And then I never have to talk about it again. I like it. Let's do that. Dirty, but, secret, you know, dirty secret. I got the test from one of my fraternity brothers. So I knew exactly <laughs> what that was going to be. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. I, I went about that all wrong. I don't, I, don't, I don't even remember what, you know, I know the difference between macro and micro, but that's about it. I do. I have that. I totally have that down. Um, but, you know, an interesting conversation for me inside of this concept of kind of coming at it from a holistic perspective, right? I, because it's, for me, it's been a rel or well, I don't know if it's relatively new inside of education in a larger space, but in my experience of education, this whole conversation about holistically coming at a child, right, or recognizing them as a full human being, not just someone to push knowledge into, um, is a new mindset of sorts. And so what's interesting for me is my background, my passion is early education and my degree is child development. So I'm all about birth through eight. And in that space, it's much more, it's seemingly much more acceptable to allow for this learner centric student led process because, you know, they're harder to control. <laughs> So you might as well let them guide you a little bit more. You're going to have an easier time. But, um, you know, we, the, the schools most recently at, we had Reggio Emilia. That was our basis. That's and it's, yeah. in, in a big, in a big picture, it was about um, giving them the materials and then allowing them to create it on their own instead of giving them the product and working backwards. It was, you know, the opposite direction. And to see where they would go with that was way bigger than we could have ever created. And if we would have created the destination for them, they would we would have never gone down some of the pathways that were allowable, right? And in our conversations, if we started out talking about butterflies and they saw a car out the window, then we switched our conversation to what was most relevant at that moment. And it was just what we did. But it seems that it's like, once they turn nine or kick into first grade, second grade, third grade, like all of a sudden we turn all that off and everything has to match this curriculum, you know, in a big sense. And I'm speaking in um, definitives here, but, you know, it becomes this, it's much less acceptable. 
which doesn't make sense to me. It's the same learner. They're still learning and processing in the same way. Why can't we switch from butterflies to cars <laughs> if we right. see that over there and allow for that conversation? And so the, you know, the great book about, or one of the great books about Reggio is the hundred languages of children, right? And mm, the idea, yeah. the idea that, you know, we, we can't, we can't know how many languages they speak right. because they have so many ways of seeing the world and whatever else. Right. But you're right. By the time they get to first, second, third grade, we've made them maybe bilingual, right? There's only, right, yeah. there's only maybe, got maybe got, you know, they, do, they do the school speak thing and then maybe they do yes. of their own stuff on the playground or whatever else. Right. right? But, but um, yeah, we do that to them. We do that. Mm -hmm. That's our choice, 100%. and we do, that, we do that because it gets too messy. Because we can't yeah. handle we can't handle the uncertainty. We can't handle the lack of structure. The whole system is run on efficiency, not effectiveness. Um, mm -hmm. And basically, if if we if we inter if we inject too much inefficiency or too much messiness into uh, into the system, then it kind of breaks down. Uh, we yeah. we kind of you know it's paralysis for us and then actually in places where that happens they kind of double down and go back like we've been talking to some schools in Alberta right now they're doubling down and going back to basics because mm. you know it's it's just like people are kind of freaked by you know giving kids more choice whatever um, it you know why wouldn't we why wouldn't we celebrate a child's innate desire to learn. Why wouldn't we celebrate a human's innate desire right, to learn right, throughout, right. throughout their lives, throughout their lives, not just yeah. when they're in school, but your innate desire to learn mine, mm -hmm. right? My, my mother's, you know, I mean, it's like if you're a human, you are always learning. Um, yeah. That's the other thing too that niggles at me, right? The whole learning loss thing, you know, it's like, come on, it's yeah. not, nobody stopped learning during the pandemic. No. They right. Stop schooling. You know? Right. Right. So yeah. Let's, let's call. If you want to call Your it version of learning in that sense, you we'll know, call it schooling loss, and that's right. fine. You want to call it, we, we lost some. <laughs> I like school, that. Right. But nobody stopped learning. I mean, that, right. that, the whole picture. Oh, they, everyone. The pandemic. They couldn't. They just sat there for like six months and nothing. You know, they didn't interact. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous when you think about right. it. Right. Yeah. So yeah. why wouldn't we honor everybody as a learner throughout their lives instead of just mm -hmm. a school? Um, yeah, it gets hard. It totally. And, you know, one one big statement for me has been recognizing um, or changing our language around that. It's not about the child and the teacher. It's about the learner. Right. The human who is learning and both of us, the child and the teacher, the facilitator and the learner. Right. We are learning together um, and we're all just humans who are learning. And I think kind of shifting the focus from what information are we going to give? Are we going to gift to this child so that we can kind of push them to these specific standards instead of changing that language to what does this human want to learn, right? If right. you're eight, you're still a human. You still have feelings and desires and all these types of things and kind of seeing them in that bigger light, not just they're just right. eight, but they are a human with desires and intentions and, you know, those right. types of things and shifting our focus them allows for us to see it in a bigger picture and then supporting them with the, the curriculum and the pedagogies that allow them to learn that thing more deeply more powerfully um yeah so would you um would you push for like do you have a certain pedagogy that you push like are do you think project-based is kind of where we need to go or what are your thoughts on that yeah, I think project based is uh, absolutely a, a step, in, a huge step in the right direction if done well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a lot of project based that isn't done well, to be honest. Right, um, right. Because it, it suffers from a real lack of student agency in the process. Um, so uh, I think project based definitely experiential learning out in the world uh, as much as possible. I love big picture schools. Um, mm -hmm. I love. A lot of the uh, schools like Northwest Passage in uh, Minnesota who take kids out into the real world for three, yeah. you know, three week trips. And, um, you know, that's the type of thing that kids need to need to do right now. We need to do that with children. Uh, we need to to show them um, how the world works in real ways. So, right. um, yeah, I think, you know, uh, anything that gets them out of the traditional rhythms of school um, the traditional silos, the traditional expectations, uh, I think is a good thing um, because I think it just opens up possibilities for us to do really, really 
fun things and really important things with kids. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, so I've loved this conversation. We've had so many big questions and things now that we need just to take on, you know, this whole system and just fix it, right? Yeah, <laughs> Except we we'll don't know what that fix looks like, but we'll just yeah, ask good week. questions. Next week. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll take care of that we'll, next week. It'll we'll put fun. that on the calendar. Um, <laughs> it'll be fine. So when people are looking for you um, and to kind of follow you, where's the best way, place is to hang out with you? Yeah, so bigquestions.institute is where you can find me. My email is will at bigquestions.institute. And uh, we're doing a series of summer workshops coming up. You can get all the info on our site. And um, yeah, I hang out on Twitter every now and then too. Although I'm, I don't know, I'm having struggles with Twitter lately. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know why. I'm, I, I think I'm on, yeah, I don't know why. I'll, I'll try to figure it out. But uh, yeah, anyway, bigquestions.institute. Yeah, um, and definitely I encourage anyone watching or watching the replay to follow Will and the stuff that they have going on because again, if you get nothing else, at least the questions will make you go, hmm, <laughs> stop for a second and think about it just a little bit. So um, thank you so much, Will, for coming and hanging out. Thank you guys who hung out in the comments and you lurkers in the background. I loved having you here. Um, I use Restream to do all of this because we get to cast all kinds of different things and I wouldn't be able to do that on my own. So. Thank you, Restream. Um, and we will see you guys next week. Have a good weekend.